So then why are you talking? Why should that matter? Maybe it's time you stopped asking questions and started having fun. I need you in one spot for a clean mind scan. What in the... What was that all about? Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show that, unlike Rick and Morty, doesn't take a break for Thanksgiving week. Luckily, though, with that one-week hiatus for Turkey Day behind us, this week finally brought us another Rick and Morty episode to gobble up and let's just say it's uh, not one to watch with the kids. I'm bonding. I'm bonding. <laughs> Definitely not one to watch with your parents either. Maybe you yourself want to take a long shower after watching this one. I just want to be clean. I, I, I feel dirty after everything that's happened. It was a weird episode full of, in my opinion, wasted potential. No offense creators of Rick and Morty, but I gotta be honest with you, cause I love ya. I mean, you put Rick in a situation where his science is rendered useless. It's like the first time ever that we really see him helpless, but then one commercial break later, he's basically being unstoppable again. That would have been so cool to explore as a concept. If I'm being honest here, it was one of my least favorite episodes of all time. Or at least the A plot of the episode was. Luckily for me, and luckily for the monetization of this video, this episode actually gave us something a bit more interesting and a lot more brand safe to talk about. So forget about that talking mythical beast. I'm far more interested in this talking regular animal. I'm a talking cat, but who cares why is my point. This episode's B story focuses on the escapades of Jerry and his newly found talking cat friend. Nameless. Season one gave us talking dogs, but step aside, Snowball. Now we got ourselves a talking cat, voiced by my boy, Matthew Broderick. Doesn't know he's my boy, but love him because he's a theater nerd like I am, and us theater nerds gotta stick together even though one isn't aware that the other one exists. Sure, Matthew's a talking cat, and no, we're not supposed to ask any questions about that, which, ironically enough, is all we're gonna be doing in today's episode about this new character in this episode. So anyway, Jerry, after finding his verbose feline friend but receiving zero answers as to what's really going on, decides he's okay enough to take a trip to Florida on the cat's request. Okay, but why Florida? Because they don't ask questions. They play volleyball, they party, and they have fun. Right. Things get considerably less fun for Jerry when the cat decides to use the beach as a litter box and chooses to blame it on uh, his human companion. Someone took a small poopy in the sand and buried it with like two little kicks and just left it here like a landmine. It was him. Things also get considerably less fun for our talking cat friend when he stops taking his own advice and breaks the number one rule of Florida, asking too many questions. It's like Fight Club for retirees. I'm asking too many questions, aren't I? How ironic. Come yeah. on to Florida, you overthinking you cat. After a long day together, Jerry and the cat's journey comes to an end when Jerry is joined by Rick, and the two of them decide that it's time to get some answers, or specifically one answer. Why does this cat talk? The cat's unwilling to spill the beans, so Rick pulls out his mind scanner. Mind scan? Look, you're overthinking it. The point of a talking cat is to have fun. And what they see, apparently defies words. Let's see the truth. What in the... Ugh. Whatever it is that they see in that cat's mind scan is enough for Jerry to lose his lunch Ugh. and his breakfast uh -huh. and probably yesterday's dinner. Ugh. We can't see what they're seeing, but one thing's clear. That cat's gotta go. Get out! Get out! <laughs> Both of them seem deeply disturbed by what they see, but luckily Rick has a solution for that. Remember the season three episode Morty's Mind Blowers that showed us how Rick has a way of wiping out memories that are too traumatizing or disturbing to deal with? Well, Rick remembers. Jerry isn't quite sure that he wants to take the easy way out though. No, I don't think we should forget. Not this. Someone has to remember. Someone will. And with that, Rick wipes Jerry's memory, but not his own, and the two of them head back home. But what a weird plot, right? I mean, out of nowhere, there's just this random talking cat, and then a trip to Florida. And then, when we see the secondhand reactions of the people who actually learn the truth of what's really going on here, it's like the most horrific thing possible. So terrifying that it even rattles the unflappable Rick Sanchez, who has literally seen it all. So, of course, on this channel, we're gonna ask the question, what did they see? What were they looking at? What is really going on with that darn cat? Look, you're overthinking it. The point of a talking cat is to have fun. The answer? Well, 
let's look at the evidence. It might be tempting to assume that the cat was responsible for some kind of unspeakably horrifying act. Something so wretched and evil that Rick and Jerry just couldn't help but be repulsed by how evil it was, but it seems unlikely that that's the case. After all, Rick and Jerry's reaction is to tell the cat to go away. Get out! Get out! Get out! Rick has no ethical qualms about killing people who deserve it, and sometimes even those who don't deserve it. So if the cat were really responsible for some kind of horrifyingly evil act, it seems pretty safe to say that he would have just killed it right on the spot. Or, at the very least, made some attempt to contain it. Or cat-tain it. He does, after all, have a prison in a secret lab under the garage, as we saw in the Season 2 episode where he was keeping Blim Blam, the baby-eating murderer, chained up. I'm a murderer that eats babies, and I came to this planet to eat babies. Rick and Jerry's willingness to let the cat go indicates that it merely bore witness to some kind of evil act, or maybe it just perpetrated an act that, while not evil per se, was so horrifying and disgusting that it offended their human sensibility. This cat might not be a threat to their physical safety, but seeing him around would be a constant reminder of the terrors that nearly drove them to the brink of madness. So the kitty has got to go. So what then could have disgusted them so much? The key word here is disgust, because it's one of the most intense emotional responses that humans can have to a given stimulus. If you drill into the psychology and evolutionary background of disgust, there's actually a really good reason for this. Disgust is meant to serve as a violent physical rejection when your body senses something that could be a potential contagion. It's what psychology professor David Pizarro at Cornell University describes as a, quote, built-in poison detector. You can even see it on infants. You put a few drops of a bitter substance on their tongue, and their tongue immediately shoots out of their mouth as their body reflexively tries to reject the bitter substance that you're trying to feed them. When we eat expired food, our body wants to throw up so as to remove the potentially spoiled or contaminated food from our system. And simply smelling, touching, or seeing something that disgusts us can trigger that same physical response, just like we see happen to Jerry. <laughs> Some things that David Pizarro notes as things that universally elicit disgust in humans are poop, vomit, blood, rotting, or decaying flesh, and what all those things have in common? Well, they're all common ways that disease spreads. So it makes sense that it would be evolutionarily advantageous for our bodies to violently reject or be disgusted by those things. However, David Pizarro notes that the list of universal elicitors of disgust include not just those substances, but also a lot of sexual acts. Which again, makes sense, considering that this is just another way for many diseases to spread, and would also explain part of why so many cultures around the world have taboos around the dirt deed. So that might be on the table as a possible explanation for why Rick and Jerry had a violent reaction to what they saw in the cat's mind. Some kind of ridiculously deviant sexual act that could be the kind of thing that would get them to have this intense sense of revulsion, while also clearly being okay enough that it isn't worth an immediate death sentence at the hands of Rick. That said, this was an episode where a dragon soul bonds with the grandfather and his two grandkids, so it's definitely on theme with the episode, and it would have to be pretty darn freaky to offend Rick. But again, this cat was totally down to soul bond with that same dragon in the post credit scene, so it's very clear that there's plenty of things that are on the table for this little tabby. This isn't the first time in the series that Jerry's had an intense disgust reaction to certain bedroom activities either. He had a negative reaction, albeit not quite as strongly, way back in the season one episode Anatomy Park. Jerry Jerry's parents come to visit the family for the holidays, and Jerry's none too happy to find out that they brought along his mother's new friend, Jacob. I watch them, sometimes from a chair and sometimes from a closet, almost always dressed as Superman. Even though both of Jerry's parents seem very happy and content with the arrangement, Jerry doesn't like it one bit. This might seem like a random thing to bring up here, but Jerry's parents may actually be important to uncovering the mystery of what this cat's up to. In the aftermath of the traumatic memory viewing, Jerry says this. He was in my home where I keep photos of my parents! Not, he was in my home where my wife and kids are, but in my home where I keep photos of my parents. Which seems to point to something involving parents or older adults. Something that he would be ashamed that his parents learned about. So, could that relate to the time that he and the cat spent together 
in Florida. Other online theorists have also pointed to the fact that the last time that we saw cats interacting with the elderly on Rick and Morty, it was on interdimensional cable, with the dead cat lady parody of Weekend at Bernie's that had a bunch of cats puppeteering a long dead woman. Mrs. Sullivan, I, uh, please forgive me for being forward, but your eyes are so beautiful. <laughs> certainly gross. It's also worth noting that it was directed and written by Jerry from another universe. Written and directed by Jerry Smith. So it's possible that that universe's Jerry was inspired consciously or by the remnants of a long erased memory by a certain trip to Florida with a particularly energetic and excitable cat. But you know what? Maybe we're barking up the wrong tree. Or whatever the cat equivalent of that is, let's like scratching on the wrong post. Anyway, there's something a lot more interesting going on here, and that is the whole meta nature as to what this cat is trying to say to us as the audience. The cat's backstory isn't what matters here, and that's kind of the point that the writers are trying to tell us. What the cat is doing in this episode is calling us out. And by us, I don't mean the general viewership of Rick and Morty, I'm saying us, the theorists watching in the audience. Here I am, standing in front of the camera right now, doing a whole episode dedicated to, whoa, there was a cat that could talk in this show. He has some sort of secret messed up backstory. What could it be? When in fact, the cat's already told us that maybe we're just better off accepting the fact that there was a talking cat in one episode, instead of ruining the fun with all these questions in our constant search for answers. Maybe it's time you stopped asking questions and started having fun. I mean, it's just a cartoon, bro. You're not meant to overanalyze every little thing, even though that is kind of the concept of these channels as they exist on YouTube. Can you tell I feel personally attacked from this episode? Luckily, I'm in good company, though. I don't have to be the one to yell at this cat for condescendingly lecturing me about how I should or shouldn't be enjoying something because Rick Sand Sanchez is here to do it for me. Find the insinuation that I can't ask questions and have fun condescending. You see, the cat sets up this dichotomy of people who ask questions about why things are the way they are, and people who just like to have fun and enjoy things without asking questions. But as Rick points out, this is a false dichotomy. It's possible to ask questions and have fun and enjoy things. That's why I exist here on YouTube. It is just fun to look at these sorts of little mini mysteries. So who is right here? The cat who says we shouldn't ask too many questions and just relax and enjoy ourselves, or Rick who insists on finding the answers to those questions? Well, let's start by picking apart the cat's perspective. The plot of this episode reveals that not even the cat himself fully subscribes to his just take it easy man philosophy. Sure, he claims that he doesn't like people asking him why he can talk, and he wants to travel to the mythical land of Florida where they never ask questions, but once he finally gets his wish in Florida, he enjoys it just for a brief amount of time before he finally starts getting a little antsy. That's great, uh, not being asked why I can talk. I'm a talking cat, but who cares why is my point. Well, uh, nice talking to you for no reason. <laughs> the very next scene, the cat himself is the one who starts asking questions that ruin everyone else's fun, and he gets himself chased out of Florida because of it. I'm asking too many questions, aren't I? How ironic. Get out of Florida, you overthinking you cat. The cat doesn't want people to ask questions. Yet, in the end, he acknowledges that asking questions is a natural response to being confronted with incomplete information. That we as humans, or as talking cats, naturally crave answers. If we're going with this meta interpretation and assuming that the cat's message here is the show's way of telling fans not to overthink the show they're watching, well, it all feels a bit reminiscent of a comment by the creators of Westworld back in 2017, after that first season had aired, which acknowledged this sort of tension between questioning fans looking for answers and the creators themselves. To quote Jonathan Nolan, one of the creators of that show, who, yes, happens to be the brother of Christopher Nolan, quote, it's annoying sometimes when people guess the twists and then blog about it, but the engagement is gratifying on one level, because if someone guesses your twist, it means you've done an adequate job of structuring the series. You can't complain when people are that engaged. It's very gratifying, 
but stop doing it, please. And that is the reason I stopped watching Westworld. Such a bummer. I hate that quote. It makes me so sad to see that. On one hand, the stop doing it, please, sounds like the plea that the cat is making in this episode. Stop asking so many questions and just enjoy the show. But even as he says this, Jonathan acknowledges that it's a good thing when people are talking about your show online, and that it's gratifying to see that sort of conversation happening. It's the cat's dichotomy. So does that mean that Rick, and by proxy, us theorists are right after all? Well, not exactly there either. Just as the cat wished for a world with no questions and wasn't happy when Florida delivered exactly what he wished for, Rick wished for answers to the question of how the cat could talk. And he too wasn't happy when he got what he wished for either. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at how we consume media, sometimes we as fans ask shows to give us answers to our questions, and we end up ultimately being unsatisfied with the answers that we get. After Star Wars The Force Awakens, we spent two years speculating about who Rey's parents could possibly be, and then found ourselves disappointed when The Last Jedi finally gave us an answer that they were nobodies. In fact, we did a whole episode on this channel at the time about how constant theorizing about Star Wars led fans to create expectations for themselves about this movie that no one could have possibly delivered on, setting us up for an inevitable disappointment. That being said, we could have been less disappointed if, you know, they had actually adhered to Chekhov's gun and all, which is also a part of that whole episode. Just saying it wasn't all our fault. Now, The Last Jedi may have been disappointing for other reasons, and it set up the question of Rey's parents as the kind of thing that would be answered before the end of the series, so they couldn't just leave us in the dark forever, but not all origin stories need to be spelled out explicitly for us, especially if they're not some big plot point like the Star Wars sequels attempted to do. Case in point, the Star Wars prequels. Was anyone really dying to find out what Anakin was like as a nine-year-old boy? Would anyone watching have been disappointed if they just, you know, left that question unanswered and just started the prequel trilogy with Anakin as a teenager, like we did with Luke in the original trilogy? It's the same thing with Solo A Star Wars Story. No one really cared about Han's early days. He was just a cool character. We didn't need him overly explained. Some questions are better left unanswered. Exactly, because no answer would be satisfying. This episode provides a perfect example. As much as we might like to theorize about what the mind scanner saw in the cat's mind, the fact that the episode didn't tell us exactly what the scanner saw made things far more interesting. It sends our imagination spinning into directions that are far more entertaining than a single answer could ever be. It's like that classic horror movie problem. The monster you can't see is always going to be scarier than the monster that you can see. Because the limits of your imagination are beyond what a practical effects department could actually show you on screen. Likewise, the traumatizing backstory that you can't see is always gonna end up being more interesting. So between the cat and Rick, whose side are we supposed to take here? I mean, this is another one of those places where the show presents us with two conflicting sides, implicitly asking the question of which one is right, and neither of them is 100% right. The answer, of course, lies somewhere in the middle. Perhaps the best solution is to ask questions and be content with not always getting all the answers. Or when you do get an answer, not being dissatisfied because you asked for it so vehemently. There are some things that demand a more than surface level analysis to fully enjoy. In fact, one of the things that we love about Rick and Morty is that it's one of those shows where we get rewarded for picking apart all the little details. However, it's easy to make the mistake of assuming that because I have questions, the show owes me answers. Yes, certain things shouldn't be left open. Nobody likes a gaping plot hole. But certain things invite speculation. And that's intentional. Answering our questions outright would kill all the fun of that. We can trust that they'll eventually pay off some of the show's bigger mysteries, like what's going on with Evil Morty and everything that's happening back at the Citadel, while accepting that we're not gonna find out exactly what it was that Rick and Jerry saw in that mind scanner. I don't think that this cat is coming back. I don't think that that's a question that's ever gonna get solved, which means that from now until the end of time, we have to be content with it just being a theory. A film theory and cut.